Listen, I, it, it's been interesting. The chairman and I have had this conversation on the floor, and several of us have. Uh, if, if I'm going to pull the crystal ball out and fast forward five hours from now or so, we're going to have a 14 to 14 vote, and we'll be locked up on this issue. I think it's good that we can talk about it. I, I have to tell you, from a state like mine that is a truly all-the-above state with a diverse energy portfolio, this kind of dialogue makes us nervous not because we're an oil and gas state and we're enslaved to oil and gas folks and the dark money is rushing at us and we're unrestrained. It's that we had, in February, 14 degrees below zero at my house, and we were below zero, well below zero, for two weeks. Well, that may be normal at some of your homes. That's not normal at ours. And in that situation, our wind towers froze up, condensate coming out of natural gas wells froze up. We have a lot of hydro. We accelerated the use of hydro. Our solar panels were covered in snow. And we were in a situation that's very unusual for us in the Southwest Power Pool to be using a majority of coal. That's not normal for us. We use a majority of wind. Unlike some other states, we use a lot of wind in our state. And while other states talk about it, we actually do it. And that's a major part of our portfolio. The fear for this is, in those peak moments, we're about to disincentivize creating fuels and maintaining facilities that will carry us through those moments. And on the most dangerous days, when it's hottest, when it's coldest, what we'll be dependent on is intermittent because the investments are not there. Now, it's not just restrictions or mandates. We all know around this group, because we track it all the time, if you disincentivize certain areas, capital stops flowing to those areas. So you stop getting capital to maintain pipelines. You stop getting capital to be able to build new natural gas facilities. And in this dialogue for a while, we've talked about natural gas as a bridge fuel, and now suddenly natural gas is evil. I have to tell you, I'm trying to track where we go in this dialogue, and I'm hopeful for a positive dialogue, but my fear is at the end of the day, I'll be called a climate change denier and you'll be called a reality denier because when we're driving vehicles, 98% of them right now are running on gas, not running on electricity. And if we shut off all that flow towards that, that's going to continue to raise prices on those that can't afford it the most. And if the push is going to be towards electric vehicles to say everybody just needs to shift to electric, I'd love for you to tell the folks that are working every day because the electric vehicles in the manufacturing location are not being driven by the folks working on the line. They're being driven by the folks in the office at the corner. And so they're not available to everyone. So I hope we can have a realistic conversation about what's really happening and about how we can deal with fuel options and keep diverse fuel options and not try to disincentivize us from actually maintaining what we're going to need as a country.